Regent Life Church family. Today we celebrate the fourth Sunday of Advent and whether you're gathered in person or online, we get to sing with the angels, glory to God in the highest. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the gift of this day and we thank you for light and we thank you for life. And I pray that our lives in return would bring you glory this day that we wouldn't just sing glory to God in the highest but that we would live it and so may the words that come out of our mouths right now and the meditation that is in our heart be pleasing in your sight O oh Lord our rock and our redeemer we come before you in worship joining with the angels joining with those shepherds and the wise men bowing before you in adoration.
You are the risen one You conquered death and made a way Yes, you are the risen one, Jesus You conquered death and made a way Lord, we join with the angels and we proclaim glory to you, God, in the highest. We thank you for your gracious favor. Would you be glorified in and through our lives as we sing? We'll give you all the glory. We gracious favor. God, we thank you for giving us the gift of yourself through your son, Jesus. Open our hearts to your presence right now, we pray, as we look into your word in Jesus' name. We pray these things. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us for Today's message, we're excited about today. We're looking at this series, The Five Gifts of Christmas, and we are on gift number four. I can't believe that we are six days away from Christmas, which if you've not done your shopping, you better get going. And uh, you have very little time left. But we, uh, we've we enjoyed this series looking at the gifts that have been given to us from our God above. We're told in the book of James, and I've referenced this verse several times, that every good and perfect gift comes to us from heaven above. God is behind every gift. He is a great gift giver. As a matter of fact, we read in John 3, 16, for God so loved us so much, for God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son. And you see, he demonstrates for us what it means to give gifts, good gifts, gifts that are life-changing. And so today we look at the gift of goodwill. Love this Christmas carol, O Holy Night. O Holy Night. I was listening to this Christmas carol this week, and the words that just kind of jumped out at me, truly he taught us, truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Look what it says in Luke chapter 2, 14. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Another translation, King James Version says, goodwill. Goodwill. So think about the goodwill and the favor that has been offered to you by God the Father. He's offered us grace, which is unmerited, undeserving favor, the favor of God, the unmerited favor, undeserving favor of God that rests on us. God gives us his favor. God gives us his peace. And God gives us opportunities every single day to offer goodwill, offer goodwill to to others. He gives us opportunities. And so the first thing if you're taking notes, the first thing that I want you just to kind of write down is opportunities for goodwill. We're given 
opportunities. It says in Galatians 6.10, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, or let us show goodwill to all people, especially, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. What a verse. What an incredible verse. As we have opportunity, and we're given opportunity. So as we're as we're given our opportunity, as we're given opportunity each and every day, let us do good. Let us do good, not just to people who we like, people are easy to do good for, uh, good to. Let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Let us take care of one another. Let us offer each other goodwill. And we see that in the book of Acts, which, by the way, I'll be picking up again in uh, January. January 2nd, we'll be going right back to Acts part two, and we'll be looking um, looking at the early church. And, and that's one of the things we've learned as a church, as we've looked back, as we've reflected on the early church. They were a group of people that offered each other goodwill. They took care of one another. If there was a need, they met it. And I said this before, and I just, I believe it with all my heart. If we are a people who will take the, take seriously the opportunities that God sets before us, if we'll meet the basic needs of people, what that does is it opens up the opportunity for us to introduce people to their greatest need. And many people aren't even aware of their greatest need, and their greatest need is Jesus Christ. And so we come across this story in Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, 25 through 37. And it's, there's a little caption above it, probably in your Bible, that says the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan. A Samaritan who offered good will. Look at this. I want you to see this. I want you to see the goodwill that was offered. What a beautiful picture of what it looks like. And there's a there's a lot of good pictures of what it looks like. And I'm going to make, you know, I'm going to make reference to a few of them today because of time. But on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. He said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus replied. How do you read it? How do you read it? What does it say to you? How does it speak to you? What, what's written in the law? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down, from Jer going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, they beat him, and they went away, leaving him half dead. Priests happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. When he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, and he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Did you hear that? He says, look after him. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Correct answer once again. Jews and Samaritans, no secret, they had no relationship. They had nothing to do with one another. And as I read this story, 
It's a parable that Jesus told. You would think, I mean, here is this man who has been beat up, this man who's been stripped of his clothes, and he's left for dead. Priest of all people, you would think a priest, when he saw this man, would have stopped, would have helped him. But the priest, when he saw the man, he went to the other side. Maybe that's what you do when you, by accident, see somebody at a grocery store that you don't really want to see. You try to dodge him. You try to go to a different aisle. I know that's been true in my own life. But a priest, and then a Levite, and I just say, you know, a, a church leader, a board member. Somebody who you would expect a little bit more from. When he saw this man, he too passed on the other side. But a Samaritan of all people, when this Samaritan is traveling, sees this man, you would think that he would have nothing to do with the situation. Again, Jews and Samaritans had no relationship. And it was the Samaritan who understood what it means to be a good neighbor, offering grace, offering compassion, offering mercy, offering good will. Good will. It says in Matthew 5, 46 through 48, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. How are we church? How are we doing how are we doing it different? How are that's something that speaks to us today. As as a church, are are we any different than the rest of the world? It's easy to love those who love you. We see that even tax collectors can do that. We see that even pagans can do that. But where the rubber really meets the road for us as believers is when we live differently, when we act differently. What does it look like? What does it look like? To all people, it says in Galatians 6, 10. That really just got, caught my attention as I was reading it. So it is easy, you know, it, it is easy um, to do good. It is easy to show love to people who are easy. It's people in our lives that are a real challenge, that are real difficult. That's when we really see what's happening in our hearts and in our lives, what's really going on. Do we really get it? Do we really understand this word found in Galatians 6.10, the opportunity. We've been given this opportunity. We're given opportunities constantly. Therefore, as we have opportunity, I would say seize, carpe diem, seize the day, seize the moment, seize the opportunity, take advantage of it. Let us do good to all people. Underline that, all people especially to those who belong to your faith family. That's why being a pastor of a local church, the people that mean the most to me are the people who are part of my local faith family. What I mean by that, let me qualify that. If there is a need that God has placed right in front of us as a church, that means more to me as a local church pastor to meet the need, the person who's sitting right in one of our chairs, in one of our services, somebody that has said, I am going to do faith. I'm going to do the faith journey with you as, as, as my church, as my church family. It's not to say that we're not going to give money to, to missions. Missions is very important. But I, I've, kind of, I've kind of classified, I've kind of put it in two groups. I, I say my immediate family. It helps me to just kind of make sense of it and put it together. My immediate family, my kids, my wife, my kids, that's my immediate family. I want to meet their needs before I meet the needs of my extended family. 
And nobody would argue that. Everybody would agree with that statement. And so the same is true in the church world. When we're looking at our extended family, is our extended family important? You better believe it. But we are not going to, we're, first and foremost, we are going to meet the needs of our immediate faith family. And so most, most local church pastors would, would agree with that statement. Um, we need to take care of one another. And we see that in the book of Acts. We see how they were taking care of one another. We see here in the book of Galatians that we need to be alert. We need to be looking. We need to be waiting. We need to be um, praying for these kinds of opportunities for us to do good for people. Offering goodwill. That's what the Samaritan, the good Samaritan, that's what he was able to do. He offered goodwill. He didn't just see a need and say, oh, somebody else can deal with it. Somebody else can take care of it. I'm too busy. He stopped. He went the extra mile. He made sure that this man who was left for dead was taken care of. And he said, if there's any additional expense when I get back, when I return, I'll make it up to you. It says in 1 John 3, 17, if anyone has material possessions, sees a brother, sees a sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? How can the love of God be in that person? We, we know that the greatest command, commandment that Jesus ever gave, and this person in this story was able to answer correctly. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and then love people. So Jesus says, if you love me, you should obey me. You, if, if, don't say that you love me if you can't obey me. And so obeying Jesus, what does that look like? He sets an opportunity before you. You see somebody who is in need and you do nothing about that need and you are able to meet that need, but you refuse to be obedient, how can the love of God be in you? If one of you says to them in James 2, verse 16, go in peace, keep warm, well fed, good luck, <laughs> but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? What good is it? You haven't shown goodwill. You said, good luck, <laughs> but wish you well. But you've done nothing to meet the need. You've done nothing to offer goodwill. James 4, 17 says, if anyone then knows the good that they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. As Christ followers, we are called to give to others the gift of goodwill. Picture of what it truly looks like, and if you didn't get it through the Good Samaritan story, I did a series not too long ago in Matthew chapter 25. I hope you remember the series. It was called, You Did It For Me. And it was a series talking about, you know, where Jesus says, I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. I was naked and you gave me clothes to wear. I was sick. You came to visit me. I was in prison. When, Lord, were you hungry? When were you thirsty? When were you sick? When were you in prison? And Jesus says, the way that you respond to people, the way that you respond to need, the way that you respond to opportunities, that is your response to me. I was the one who was hungry. I was the one who was thirsty. I was the one who was naked and needed clothes. I was the one who was sick. I was the one who was in prison. A list of opportunities. Opportunities to meet the needs of people. To be Jesus. So taking notes, opportunity. That's, that's a big word. Opportunities to do good will. Second thing we see is 
how we can overcome evil. We can actually overcome evil by goodwill. We're told that. We don't give people evil for evil. <laughs> it says we're not repaying people evil for evil. We're repaying them evil. They give us evil, we give them good, right? Look what it says in Romans 12, 17 through 21. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right. We need to be a people who are being careful. Careful to do what's right. Careful to see needs. Careful to, to seize the day, to walk through the open doors that God opens up for us to, to meet these opportunities, to embrace these opportunities. These are people. These are needs. So if it's possible, it says, as far as it depends on you, you, as far as it depends on you, you've been given the opportunity. You've had a need placed in front of you. So as far as it depends on you, you live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge. My dear friends, Leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if, you're, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. See, we're not just talking about feeding people who we like, feeding our friends, feeding our family. That, those are all, that, that's important. But it, it goes on to say, remember, as I read in Galatians chapter 6, to all people, showing goodwill to all people. If your enemy's hungry, Feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. All these acts of kindness, these opportunities for us to show goodwill. Show goodwill. God has shown us what it looks like. He's offered us goodwill. He's offered us grace. He's a God who can meet all of our needs according to his riches and glory, which are in Christ Jesus. He meets our needs. He gives us good gifts. And so may we be people who offer goodwill. May we walk in his footsteps. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household. Here we go. Here we're talking about the immediate family, right? Has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Worse than somebody who has never put their faith or trust in Jesus Christ. Very, very powerful words. So we want to make sure that we're providing, that we're taking care of, that we're meeting the needs of, of others. Again, we're not, we're, we're not neglecting, we're not pushing it aside, we're not saying, you know what, I'm going to walk on, a, on the opposite side of the street, I just, I'm going to close my eyes, to, I don't want to see it. I mean, it would be easy to say that in Southern California, there are needs all over the place. And God hasn't asked me, God hasn't asked me to meet all of the needs. God has said, I'm a God who can meet all needs. <laughs> You're not God. You can't meet all needs. But the opportunities that I set before you, when you have an opportunity to do good, when you have an opportunity to share, when you have an opportunity to make a sacrifice, when you have an opportunity to, to show good will, do it. Be wise in the way that you act. Think about the way that you act. People are watching you. It says, be wise in the way that you act toward outsiders, Colossians 4, 5. Make the most of every opportunity. Making the most of every opportunity. So let me review again. Point number one. Point number one, opportunities for goodwill. I want us to be praying for opportunities to offer goodwill. I want us to be obedient to, which is my third point, but I want us to, to respond to the opportunities that God sets before us, the doors that he opens. So opportunities for goodwill. Uh, the second thing that I made mention of is overcoming evil by good, by goodwill. 
what a what an opportunity that gives to us. I mean, it, it sets us apart. People are going to start asking questions. They're, they're going to start scratching their heads. They're going to want what we have when they see that we are, our response is one that is different than any other response, different than the responses that you expect from the world. As the church, we are called to be different. We're not repaying somebody evil for evil, no. That's what everybody else does. As a church, as Christ followers, we're going to, aren't you glad that God doesn't treat us as our sins deserve? But he, what does he offer to us? He offers us forgiveness. He offers us grace, mercy, love, unconditional love. This, these are the things he offers to us. And so as Christ followers, we want the world to see Jesus. We want the world to know Jesus. So we need to represent well. We need to be like that Samaritan in the story who doesn't go to the other side of the road, but who says, an opportunity has been set before me. A need is right in front of my eyes. What am I going to do about it? Am I going to do anything about it? Am I going to ignore it? Am I going to close my eyes to it? Am I going to say, somebody else can do it? Or am I going to say, God, you set this before me? And my response, which is my third point, is going to be one of obedience. Obedience to goodwill. Obedience. When God shows you a need, when God shows you a person, when God presents this opportunity, and that's what it is, it's an opportunity for you to be obedient. Look at it like that. It's an opportunity. This is an opportunity that's been set before me for me to be obedient for me to feed Jesus, for me to give him something to drink, for me to put clothes on his back, for me to visit him when he's sick or in prison. Because the way that we respond to others is our response to Jesus Christ himself. And I hope that this Christmas that you will respond, that you will respond to Christ, that you will say yes to him, as he gives you opportunities. And may we overcome evil. The only way we're going to overcome it is by, is by being good, by doing good, by doing right, by offering goodwill to others, offering people what, again, what's been offered to us. I can't give what I, I can't give to you what I haven't myself received. I've been given God's love. That's, therefore, I can love you. I can't love you by myself because of me. I'm filled with God's love, and because of God's love living in me, I can love you. You can't give what you don't have. You can't give what you don't have. You can only give away what's been given to you. And it's all come to us from God above the giver, the giver of good gifts. I want to spend a moment at the table with you, remembering what Jesus Christ has done for us. He came to die for us. God gave us his son as a gift, as a great gift, the greatest gift we've ever been given, the gift of Jesus. He came, he lived a life in front of everybody, the kind of life that we're supposed to live. He was obedient to death on a cross. He submitted to the Father. He lived a life of obedience. He was without sin, never sinned, but yet he took your sin and my sin with him to the cross. And so today as we sit at this table and we prepare ourselves for this meal together, I want to encourage you just in the next couple of moments to grab a piece of bread or a cracker, something that helps you to remember the body of our Lord Jesus. And then I want you to also grab something to drink be it water, juice, wine, something that helps you to remember what Jesus Christ has given for you. So take a moment to do that. Go and gather that. And as you're gathering that, we will be listening to another song. And after that song, we will resume. We will eat together the body of our Lord.
the blood of our Lord we will drink together in remembrance of what Jesus Christ has done for us, but also remembering what Jesus Christ has asked of us. And he has asked that we will be faithful, that we will be obedient, that we will, as he gave us this great commission to go change the world, that's what he's asking us to do. He's saying, go and change the world. And I'm going to be with you as you go and as you make disciples. So take a few minutes to reflect upon all the gifts that God has given to you and this precious gift, the gift of his son, Jesus. My prayer, my desire is that you, that you will receive him. Well, as we prepare to come to the table this morning, we're reminded of all that God has done for us through Jesus. For the gift of peace we have through the blood of Christ. For the gracious favor that God has lavished on us. This gift from God. And we join angels this morning and we join the, the shepherds from thousands of years ago and those wise men from the east. We humbly come before God and worship Him for the gift of His Son, our Savior, our Messiah, our Lord. And we sing with reverence and awe. Oh, come let us Haste, haste to bring him, 
Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. Thank you for your gift of grace. We sing. Oh, come, let us adore you. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us This is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord, and it's made ready for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. Access to the Lord's table is not a right conferred upon the worthy, but it's a privilege given to the undeserving who come in faith, repentance, and love. You know, even one who has doubts or whose trust is wavering may come to the table in order to be assured of God's love and grace in Jesus Christ. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often and you who have not been here very long, you who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come because it's the Lord who invites you and it's his will that those who want him should meet him right here. This serves today as a reminder of the body of our Lord. He was beaten beyond recognition, bruised for our transgressions. And so today, church, we eat to remember, we drink to remember what Christ has done for us and what he has asked of us, the body of our Lord. On the same night that he was betrayed, he shared the cup with the disciples. He said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And so we drink to remember our Lord. His blood shed to wash away all our sins. Well, thank you for joining us today. I uh, hope that you have a wonderful week as we're preparing ourselves, as we're getting ready for our Christmas Eve service, which will be 6 o'clock on Christmas Eve, Pacific Standard Time. We will have the service online for you as well. And then we, and we will also be on site. If you are in the San Diego area, come and join us. And then on the 26th will be our Christmas celebration as we talk about the fifth and final uh, gift that God has given to us, his great love. God bless you. Stick around, sing another song or two with us as we, as we uh, get ready for our week and as this becomes our response to what we have heard today. Let's show goodwill. Now we respond, God, to your gift of grace in worship. We sing to you and you alone. For you Singing of goodness. I 
will sing of your goodness. I will sing of your love. Though the seasons come quickly, you have always been enough. Though the night may get darker, though the waiting seems long, you have always been faithful to remind me of your love. And we sing to you. Thank you. 